Hello, and welcome to episode 12 of Digital Ascendancy, a Power Light Info podcast series. Today on Digital Ascendancy, we have Niles Burbank and Jeff Daly from AMD and Mike Himbolt from Powerline as they discuss the latest developments from PyTorch, specifically the announcement that PyTorch is becoming part of the Linux Foundation, what it means for platform users, and why the platform can give you new gains, free you from certain dependencies, all while allowing you to keep your code and workloads as is. So without further ado, let's jump in. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to Powerline's podcast. Today we have AMD, and we're going to be talking about PyTorch and GPU acceleration. Uh, my name is Mike Kimbo. I'm Powerline's field CTO. And with me, I have Niles and Jeff from AMD. Niles, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Niles Burbank. I'm a product management director at AMD. And uh, I guess most relevant for today's discussion, I'm also the AMD representative to the governing board of the PyTorch Foundation. Excellent. Thanks. Jeff, how about you? Yeah, I'm Jeff Daly. I'm a principal member of technical staff at AMD. I've been in software development over 17 years. I'm the chief architect for the machine learning software engineering group uh, that supports the machine learning frameworks such as PyTorch, uh, Onyx Runtime, and TensorFlow. Um, yeah, I joined uh, AMD about five years ago. So. Outstanding. Well, it's a pleasure to have you both here. Um, the uh, the main topic that we're going to be talking about today is PyTorch and AMD and what it meant to get AMD to be a part of that, a part of this huge project. I know it's a big difference for a lot of folks. So PyTorch is now part of the Linux Foundation, and I'll, I'll let you two decide which one of you wants to handle the question best. But what does that mean for users of PyTorch for it to be part of the Linux Foundation now? So um, sure. Uh, uh... I think actually in a lot of cases, uh, I'll start with a response and then Jeff can add on if it needs to. Uh, so the, the PyTorch Foundation, which was recently created under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation, uh, I would say represents the natural next step in the evolution of PyTorch as it becomes an even more essential part of the AI and ML workflow across a range of different users and applications. Uh, with the creation of the PyTorch Foundation, users of PyTorch can have even more confidence in the future of PyTorch as a long-term open source project. And that that in turn gives them the confidence that they can safely invest and work using PyTorch, knowing that it can be leveraged over the long term. Um, right. In terms of how users interact with PyTorch, the framework itself, nothing really changes. Uh, all the code that they may have written up to this point continues to work uh, unchanged. Uh, it's probably also worth noting that the PyTorch Foundation is focused primarily on the business government of PyTorch. Uh, and that includes things like outreach activities, uh, certification programs, conferences, uh, protection of the PyTorch brand and logo, and, and so forth. Uh, the technical governance of PyTorch remains with the maintainer community. Uh, so that's a continuation of the approach that existed up to this point. Great. And so AMD is part of this, this the governance committee, and how does that relate to both the, the business governance and the, the technical maintenance of it? How does AMD participate in those two separate groups? Uh, well, uh, I'll start with some general comments, and then Jeff can probably comment on the technical side. Uh, so first I'll say that the, the goals of the PyTorch Foundation are uh, very much aligned with a, AMD's goals. Uh, in particular, AMD shares the foundation's aim to build a vibrant AI and ML community and the foundation's embrace of open source software. Uh, so uh, we're looking forward to, uh, on the business side, uh, working with our partners in the foundation to advance AI and ML innovation and, and to make high-performance machine learning available to everyone, whether that's uh, users of exascale supercomputers uh, all the way down to the individual researchers. Uh, and, and AMD executives often talk about our focus on, on AI and ML as a, a company and a, under the terminology of the face of AI. And, and our involvement with the PyTorch Foundation is just one concrete example of that face of AI philosophy. Great. Jeff, can you tell us a bit about how um, AMD being part of that technical maintenance, the, the maintainers yeah. of PyTorch, right? how, how that factors in? So as... Uh... As tech lead for this group, uh, one of the things I get to do is I spend a lot of the time reviewing pull requests. Um, and through that process, uh, we stay up to date on uh, what's going on in PyTorch. Um, 
So in addition to these technical reviews um, and just contributing code, uh, we also have regular uh, meetings and phone calls uh, with various contributors um, to stay you know, up to date with what's going on. Um, for example, the PyTorch 2.0 announcement, uh, we were given some heads up that that was coming um, so that we could prepare for it. Um, yeah, and so we also have a Slack channel. Um, that's uh, how we communicate with a lot of the maintainers on Rockham specific or AMD specific uh, concerns. So uh, a lot of interaction with a lot of different uh, companies as well as maintainers of PyTorch. It's, we're all one big happy family working together. That's great. So I, I want to sort of grab that little piece, that little in there, the one big happy family and, and link that back to the beginning, the, the open source, long-term supported machine learning framework. Because I know so I myself have been doing general purpose GPU computing since before CUDA and GPGP was a thing, right? Shoehorning your algorithms into vertex and pixel shaders and praying it works. And for a long time, folks have been stuck with, uh, I mean, I don't say stuck with OpenCL or the alternative, and that's been fine, but having a, a, another robust, just um, end to end, especially one so aligned with Linux and the open source philosophy and foundations, having that available now as a first class supported stack for PyTorch, what is what do you see that meaning for customers that are that have been doing this or have or just sort of getting you know have been in it for a you know a generation or two of hardware they've been they've been drinking the CUDA or the OpenCL Kool-Aid. How do you see this starting to affect them when they start to look at either a hardware refresh, um, updating their model structures, like what some of these major life cycle events that would uh, that may help them take advantage of a new a new platform, a new stack. Yeah. So again, I'll, I'll provide some general commentary. So having Rockham as, as a ingredient in the a supported, uh, a formally supported PyTorch build uh, is, from a customer point of view, it, it, the glib answer is that it, everything just works. That uh, mm. they can interact with PyTorch APIs and they don't need to worry about the underlying software. Uh, but to, to provide a, a more detailed, maybe more helpful answer, uh, you know, having this level of support provides a, a couple of benefits to the, to the user. Um, simple installation of the framework, uh, whether that's from the instructions on the install page of the uh, PyTorch website, uh, from a Docker container hosted on Docker Hub, or a in the case of more adventurous users, if they want to build PyTorch from source. Uh, it also provides some guarantees of robustness and quality and, and a standard set of APIs that are shared across different hardware architectures. So I, I know, I, I, so speaking as Powerland, we satisfy post-secondary institutions ranging from small community colleges to large research institutions. And we've got a bunch of them that, you know, we've got two chassis, each with a, you know, eight K eighties in it. And we're thinking it's time to upgrade. This is the kind of thing where, well, if the you know, predominantly you're working with PyTorch based applications, you have a lot more options for upgrades now than you did not even a handful of months ago. Is that, is that an accurate statement? Um, yes, it is. Great. I don't know, Jeff, do you have anything else to add to add to this one? Just sort of on the technical side, like, I mean, how long has this been in the works? What was involved? Any of that kind of part? I'm actually Niles has some background on uh, how long this has been in the works. So. Uh, sure, uh, I'll start sure. with a, a little bit of a digression into to the history of Pinky software at, at AMD. Yeah, uh, sure. So the uh, the software architecture that eventually became Rockham uh, was first announced at the Supercompute 2015, the Supercompute in, in Austin, Texas, that year, uh, as the Boltzmann Initiative, uh, and then that software was released as Rockham initially in early 2016. And, and over the last six years and change, we've made a, you know, multiple Rockham releases per year uh, to add new features, uh, to optimize performance, and, and to add support for new hardware architectures. Uh, and we've been working on PyTorch for almost as long as we've been working on Rockham uh, since shortly after the initial PyTorch release in 2018. Uh, that's a long time. So has it been pretty steady progress throughout those? I mean, it's been about six years now. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so like I said, I joined about five years ago, uh, the PyTorch project at AMD had already been started, already had some great foundation. Um, and we've seen our community grow. We've seen uh, just the number of source contributions grow from our team. Our team itself has grown. I remember it was a very, very nimble, small team initially, and we've doubled uh, year on year. Uh, just fantastic growth just in personnel. Oh, wow. And so all of this is just contributing to uh, AMD GPU support for Rock, uh, for uh, PyTorch. And at this point, we've gone from uh, maybe not full feature support to now we're fully feature uh, comparable with our competitors and um, we're ready for all workloads. So just phenomenal growth even since I joined. So what, what would you say were some of the most significant milestones in, in reaching that full feature parity and, and what was involved? Was it, was it drivers? Was it PyTorch to code changes? Was it contributions back to like operating system? Like, like what, what was involved in making those milestones possible? Yeah. So I, again, I'll, I'll maybe provide some higher level comments and, and Jeff can, can add details. Uh, but initially there were, you know, as we thought about bringing uh, support for acceleration on AMD GPUs to PyTorch, uh, there were a set of technical decisions that needed to be made, uh, particularly around how similar or how different the interfaces to access an AMD GPU should be as compared to other accelerated car applications. And uh, ultimately, the consensus was that we were going to leverage uh, the same sort of uh, APIs that were used for. Uh, accelerators supporting the CUDA architecture. And, and that provided the benefit of allowing code written for PyTorch on those other accelerator architectures to, to run on Rockham with uh, very minimal or, or in a lot of cases even zero changes. Uh, and, and then that was followed by uh, you know, years of development work that Jeff alluded to, uh, to gradually add features, uh, add robustness and add performance optimizations. Um, the other thing I'll say is uh, at a business level, uh, at each stage of the process, we needed to demonstrate to the PyTorch community uh, that our implementation was sufficiently mature that it could be exposed to a wider audience without uh, inducing a, a spike in reported issues or, or otherwise tarnishing the uh, reputation. Yeah, I bet that was a challenge. Uh, Jeff, do you have any details you can share on how the technical team managed that challenge? Yeah, so I, I would add that uh, when I even joined the project, we already had uh, continuous integration set up. And we've had that, you know, for day one since since I joined. And so that's, that's probably the most uh, reliable and most user visible uh, signal to the community that uh, of our stability. And so having CI resources against every commit uh, that goes into PyTorch really helps uh, you know, bolster the, the reputation of what we're doing. Um, I think when, so uh, Niles kind of alluded to uh, these decisions that were made early on, uh, and I'll kind of elaborate on one of them, and that is because CUDA interfaces came first uh, into PyTorch, um, the decision we made was, you know, we could force users or, or force, I guess, uh, what's a good word for it, uh, our ego <laughs> into PyTorch. Uh, we could force everyone to say, hey, if you want to use a GPU device, it has to say Rockham, it has to say AMD, you know, something specific to what we do. Um, but we made the decision that, okay, the CUDA interfaces are already there. There's already a CUDA module. Um, there's already a device called CUDA. We can make everybody have to rewrite their models uh, <laughs> or we can just use what's already there. Um, and that decision has really allowed us to accelerate uh, model bring up. So you can take anything out of Hugging Face as an example, and it runs today on our GPUs. And that's because we didn't want to force people right. to have to rewrite their models. Um, and it turned out that was a, a great decision made many years ago um, that's really benefited us. So. Yeah, I bet. I mean, personally, having used CUDA in a bunch of different contexts, it's opinionated enough. Uh, adding another layer of opinionation around how how I then port my code, I mean, it would have made the process a lot more daunting, a lot more challenging. And for large teams, it's cheaper to just 
keep drinking the same color Kool-Aid yeah. they always were just because it's easier. So that's an interesting choice that, that was made that, you know, it makes it easier for teams to, especially now, step back, take a look and go, okay, well, we need accelerators. Let's consider the performance and the, the value adds of different accelerators, not just we need to go and buy this, the next generation of this GPU because it's what our code works with. Um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's fantastic. That that really adds a ton of flexibility for model development, for model deployment, right? Even being able to train on one type and deploy on another. Yeah. And you've got right. I mean, it's it it gives the that flexibility for for architecture for adopting public cloud providers and models where you maybe don't always know what you're gonna get. You know, or you if you live in spot in Amazon and it's right around the NeurIPS conference and there's nothing available from NVIDIA, having the opportunity to deploy on another GPU type and not just going, ah, oh, shucks, I guess we'll keep trying the spot button. Right? I mean, having, uh, I, think, I think that's fantastic. This is going to do, I think this is going to do a lot for, for the ecosystem and for the industry itself. Um, one of the things I, I didn't touch on was, uh, I guess, the level of effort that went into everything. So that the decision to uh, what we like to call masquerade uh, as CUDA or implement those uh, interfaces in PyTorch. Um, what I didn't touch on was how much not just the PyTorch team has grown uh, and our contributions have grown, but really the entire Rockham software stack. And so as new features came in to, for instance, MI Open, which is our convolution library, um, supporting mm -hmm. uh, additional like 2D, 3D convolutions, um, making them faster, changing the API interfaces, um, and then having to integrate those back into PyTorch. Um, support for, for BLAS, uh, so Rock BLAS. Um, these are just some of the library components that are part of Rockham that as those features became more mature, then we could enable those features in PyTorch. And so it's been a, a cross-team right. collaboration effort. If you looked at just the source line contributions and PR authors coming from AMD, that's really just kind of the tip of the iceberg. There is a large supporting base of libraries and our libraries team at AMD um, that contribute performance and stability um, that we just take advantage of. Yeah, so I mean, that makes a good point, right? There's lots that goes underneath. You know, there's the announcement, you know, Rockham is now a first class supported stack for PyTorch, but there, there's so much, there's so much of that iceberg that sits below the water below the waterline that it's tough to see, that it's tough to hear about, uh, that we may not hear about. What would you say, and this goes to both of you gentlemen, uh, is maybe one of the biggest or the biggest sort of comes to mind thing that AMD has done, uh, either related to Rockham or supporting libraries that either other accelerator vendors maybe are, you know, haven't bothered with or that they've just sort of taken for granted they did a decade ago and are kind of coasting on that one. What sort of sets AMD apart on this one either at the business unit the technical the community like any of those well the, the, that's sort of an open question but uh, <laughs> it absolutely is one, one thing that comes to mind uh, for for me it is uh, you know like a, a lot of our listeners you see that there, there's this huge number of, of ml startups and, and new entrants into the market and and it seems like by and large they're all focused on some hardware innovation they can bring to bear on the problem and software in a lot of cases is an afterthought. And uh, at AMD, we've learned through a couple of decades in the GPU business that software is an essential part of a complete solution. And that's every bit as true for ML as it, as it was for graphics when we started out. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and I guess to, to add to that, uh, even just one thing software together into a single bucket it is probably not doing it justice because uh, you know, software includes uh, drivers, uh, associated libraries, uh, development tools, profilers, debuggers, and a complete and accurate set of documentation. So that, there's a lot of complexity there. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot goes into that. And it's, uh, I know, I mean, being the owner of some reasonably old AMD equipment personally, uh, AMD sort of has a reputation of supporting that gear for a long time, driver updates for a long time, and that, that old equipment staying either modern 
reasonably modern or, or just squeezing more and more out of it over time, which is something that not every option in the market has. You know, I mean, I've, there's there's some fascinating things the open source community has done with AMD's open source approach to the driver model to make old cards work with brand new games that their competitors from that same era don't work. So it's it's going to be exciting to see how folks take use of that philosophical approach to software development, not just the software itself. So Jeff, how about you? Like, is there anything sort of big that jumps out at you that AMD's done different here that really sets it apart? I think it's a relentless pursuit of performance. And I think you kind of hinted at that a little bit and that uh, there's continuous updates. Software is something that, uh, and Niall said it too, that it's something that AMD values in addition to the hardware. So it's the combination of software and hardware. And we, we don't stop as soon as we achieve some performance milestone. And this is something that's been really exciting and something I got to present actually at the PyTorch conference uh, just a few weeks ago. And so we got to present performance results uh, on our MI250 uh, Instinct uh, GPU. And it was absolutely fantastic to, to show the world that um, compared to A100, we were 1.4 uh, to 1.6 times faster on a range of hugging face models. And it's because we didn't stop. Uh, you know, as soon as we achieve parity, no, nope, mm -hmm. we don't stop there. We're going to keep going. There's still plenty of potential in our hardware. And it's exciting as a developer. And I get to see behind the scenes how things are done. And just to see iteration after iteration, each new rock version, we continue to push the envelope and get as much performance as we can out of our existing hardware. I know I said MI250, which is our, our current uh, GPU, but even some of our older GPUs, MI100, MI50, we continue to get fantastic performance out of these devices. Well, and that's a great point because the hardware you buy is the hardware you buy. The stuff you install, the silicon doesn't change. The firmware can make it better, but the silicon at the end of the day doesn't change. And AMD has a great track record of not giving up on something, giving up on a piece of architecture or equipment or you know, any of that kind of stuff, if it doesn't work in the first year. I mean, we've seen that from other providers in this space, but, you know, AMD's four-year approach to market dominance of, you know, let's, let's give it time. Things take time. And that relentless pursuit means that three years, you know, two years, three years down the road, the equipment you bought no longer performs the same. It performs better. And measurably and markedly so, whether that be in raw performance, performance per watt, whatever their metric is, it's probably doing a bit better than it was when you bought it. So that's, yeah, that's also great. I mean, that's, that's huge. I think so uh, I know we're, we're, Oh, sorry. I was, I was going to say no, one of the other things ahead. that uh, I would say differentiates us uh, from our competitors is that we've been doing all of this hand in hand with our customers and open source. And it's fantastic that, you know, we don't just throw something over the fence uh, to those that want it. Uh, it's been, a collaboration and a tight collaboration with some of our customers uh, for years. And I think that's been the most rewarding process is they're not just buying our GPUs, uh, they're buying our support. And it's something that we're committed to and we're committed to doing in the open and getting community contributions back. And it's, it's that interplay that I think has really taken us beyond just kind of the, the status quo. Yeah, That's I, I would underscore that point, and particularly in the world of machine learning, where there's such a strong emphasis on open source, and AMD having a stance that's aligned with that uh, allows us to, to work with the community much more effectively than we could otherwise. So in, in the case of PyTorch, uh, we're not off in, in our own sandbox developing something and then trying to argue later for its inclusion. We are developing uh, by making contributions directly into the primary branch of my Right. Yeah, that's great. So, we, I mean, I, we touched a bit on it uh, earlier on, and I want to make sure we come back to it before we, before we end the podcast here. Uh, other frameworks. I mean, you, you talk, talked a bit about TensorFlow. We're talking mostly about PyTorch here, but what can you tell us what other frameworks you might be working on? Um, sure. Uh, so we've been talking about Rockham, obviously, mostly in the context of PyTorch today. Uh, 
but blockchain exposes a set of capabilities that are applicable to a wide range of compute workloads. Uh, so in the world of ML, that includes TensorFlow, uh, which leverages Rockham in much the same way that PyTorch does. Uh, and, and we also support Microsoft's Onyx runtime uh, robustly as well. Um, in, in that case, the, the specifics are a little bit different, but we're working very closely with Microsoft. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, Rockham provides the basis for uh, our acceleration of HPC workloads. And increasingly, uh, HPC, uh, which historically was distinct from ML, uh, HPC workloads are becoming interested in using ML or becoming more tightly integrated with ML. Uh, so having Rockham as the, uh, the shared basis for both those kinds of workloads is very helpful for us. Yeah, I bet. Okay, well, this has been fantastic. Uh, is there any sort of last little bits you want to share before we before we leave our viewers to the rest of their day? Things that I forgot to ask or that weren't on the agenda? Uh, so hey, maybe just coming back to PyTorch, uh, I'll note that uh, at the recent PyTorch conference, uh, one of the major announcements was uh, with the upcoming PyTorch 2.0 release. And uh, at AB, we're really looking forward to uh, taking advantage of some of the new acceleration capabilities that are going to be exposed for compiled kernels in, in PyTorch 2.0 to provide even higher performance than we've been able to deliver up to this point. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for your time. This has been excellent. I know I've learned some stuff. I'm sure some of our viewers have too. Uh, I'm looking forward to being able to share this video after the fact with, with a, plenty of folks. Uh, this has been a wealth of information. I really appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, and for anyone else watching, if you're interested in how to learn more, you build solutions around this or anything else, give your Powerline account manager a call or give our main line a call. We're happy to help. Thanks. Take care. Thank you for watching. And remember to like and subscribe. And hit the bell notification to get the latest and greatest videos from Powerland when they come out. Follow us on social media at Powerline underscore CA on Twitter, Powerline Canada on LinkedIn, and on Facebook to hear about the latest and greatest in IT solutions.